much. Thank you very much. I would like to thank the organizer for giving us opportunity to share the results during the BOOP symposium. Um, and together with the, with the colleagues from the Faculty of Food Science and Fisheries, we um, would like to share the study uh, with the title Exploiting the Inviters. Um, a, a bit bold title, um, because this is a case study on utilization of two invasive alien uh, species in, in, in Poland. Uh, Okay, so how we consider, how we perceive, sorry, how, how we perceive the, um, the alien species, invasive alien species, and the invasiveness, it's that the invasive species um, might be translocated due to the human activities, but, or the, or the invasive alien species might extend its, its actual range of existence so the, the the expansion of the habitat and of course if it's invasive and it's alien it has uh the, the species negative uh, impact for sure on the biodiversity but also uh on ecosystem functioning and on the other hand the invasive species uh, can also adversely affect uh, the economy of the country and for example in the latest report uh, published by the European Union regarding the invasiveness of the alien species is that uh, some countries spent approximately from 17,000 euro up to even 4 million euro to eradicate uh, alien species from the, from the country, from the specific country. But also the um, invasive species uh, can also have negative impact on animal health. So the, the, there are numerous examples, and one of them is uh, is the plant that can, can irritate the skins when, for example, you touch it or you stamp on the on the animals when you wait in the in the in the in the marine uh, environments. Um, and the report that I mentioned. Um, has been published uh, exactly a week ago on 13 October 2021 and underlined that currently we've got 30 animal species, of course, uh, invasive alien, 36 plant species, 41 primary terrestrial species, 23 primary freshwater, one brackish and one marine. And uh, until now, none has been taken off the list. And on the map, you see the concentration so, in fact, the number of the invasive alien species um, per country. Uh, yeah, I'll just uh, switch on the laser pointer. So, most of the invasive alien species are uh, located, so might be found in the Netherlands, in Belgium, Germany, uh, and also uh, England, southern part of the central and southern part of the England. Um, and in case of our studies, we would like to share the results uh, from the PhD studies, but also a bachelor studies and also studies that we perform within our departments of so Department of the Meat Science within the Faculty of Food Science and the Fisheries. And we uh, were focused and we are still focused on um, two species. One of them, it's a spiny chick cryfish, the cryfish that has been translocated to Europe at the end of the 19th century and to Poland in 1982, but by the Max von den Borne, so the German zoologist who intend to, to import the species to uh, supplement uh, cryfish aquaculture because in the past years, the, the native cryfish species like the Astacus astacus, so it's a noble uh, cryfish, uh, has been severely exploited. So the, 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 the scientists decided that he will bring, they will import from the US a new species to enrich aquaculture for, uh, for the cryfish to, of course, to get more meat from this uh, species. There are several, um, features uh, that mm, are specific for the species, like the orange tips of the claws or the cherry stripes of the abdomen, uh, the lack of the reach on the rostrum, 
but the the name comes from the spikes on the on the cheeks and you will probably easily identify the species when you will uh, meet it based on the for example the cherry stripes and the, the species it's very specific because it has a uh, the r strategy for its development for the to sustain its population so this means that the maturation for the mice and females is reached within two years the females are has a very high fecundity so numerous eggs are produced and the hatching rate is very high and also this uh, species has a very uh, efficient strategy against to be eaten by for example pike perch or eel so it forms a bowl and and, uh, and fish cannot eat it for example and uh, mm, when the when the cryfish uh, was important to, to to Poland because the results that you see here on the on the graph shows the changes in the number of the bodies inhabited by the spiny cheek cryfish, so the Faxonus limosus, or the noble cryfish, it's uh, Astacus astacus, and it clearly shows that since the species was introduced to the um, Polish, uh, to the water bodies in Poland, the, there was a significant decrease of the number of the Astacus astacus individuals in the, of course, through the perspective of the water bodies and the steep increase of the water bodies where the Faxonus limosus, so the spiny chick cryfish, uh, has been uh, identified. Because I didn't mention also about uh, one crucial um, issue is that the, when the, the spiny chick cryfish has been moved to Poland, uh, together with the cryfish, uh, we also, um, and also the other scientists, also found that the cryfish has uh, um, a fungus-like omicet. It's uh, a phanomyces astaci, which is uh, responsible for the cryfish plaque, so the for the disease. And the disease disseminated the population of the astacus astacus, so the Faxonius limosus, use this opportunity to inhabit the uh, water bodies uh, without any, let's say, uh, problems. So this is the first species that I will talk today. And the second, uh, and just one more uh, remark, uh, according to this species, the species is a, um, it's a freshwater species and uh, also rather prefer uh, a water bodies with the average water temperature not not higher for example than 20 25 so preferable lower than 20. in case of the gulf wedge clams so rangia cuneata uh, later during the presentation i will use the name rangia mm, the species it's a typical marine species that prefer highly uh, saline uh, saline environments um, 30 or uh, 30 even something 5 ppm and uh, warm water and in this is also warm water species and the species was translocated from the gulf of mexico and as we went through the uh, studies um, we found that the species appeared in 2010 in vistula lagoon then spread in the vistula lagoon and then within the next several years so up to 2016 as we went through the papers we found that the species appeared also in the Estonia, in Sweden, and also in the Germany. When we will jump to the right pane of the of the picture, and this is a, a zoomed part that is shown here in the in the box. Um, Szczecin is a bit lower from this uh, city of the Polica, and uh, as we see here. In 2018, this uh, Rangia, the individuals of the Rangia were found in the Szczecin, uh, sorry, in the Świnoujście island Uznam. And then the species just moved uh, southwards. But I, as I said, this, uh, the species, the Rangia, prefer high salinity. In the Pomeranian Bay, you will find approximately 6 ppm. And in the Szczecin Lagoon, in the northern part, it will be one or two. So probably the one or two uh, so the Szczecin Lagoon might act as a uh, 
geographical uh, and hydrochemical border for this species. And we observed since the 2018 that the species has uh, invaded or moved or inhabited uh, rivers and lakes or small bays within this region. So we decided that uh, this species is uh, worth to study. It's worth to, to find out what kind of uh, value, nutritional or culinary value uh, provide. But also, we're also interested in the population dynamics, and I will mention about it uh, a bit later. Um, in case of the sampling, as you see in the corners, when I will talk about uh, one or, or both species, then you will see the two pictograms. And when I will talk about only one, the one of the pictograms will be visible. But in case of the sampling, uh, we went quite broad because we're interested in the basic characteristics. So not only the morphometry, the yield of meat, in, in case of the rangia, the yield of edible parts. Um, the next in the methods, we're interested in the proximate analysis. So the content of the protein, fat, ash, moisture, and also energetic value. Uh, next, the not only the, the, the level of the protein or the level of fat, it's... Um, it's important, but also the quality indices of the protein and fat. So these are just the example, like the chemical score or the essential amino acid level or essential amino acid index in case of the protein quality. Uh, but in case of the fat uh, here, uh, as you can see, the ratio between N3 and N6 fatty acids and also arteriogenic or thrombogenic uh, indices. These are just just the example. Later, I will show you a bit more uh, of it. Um, and also, uh, in 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 uh, relation to the nutritional value, but also to the food safety, we're interested in the several in the level of the um, elements in the meat and also edible. Parts. We also assess the pH, color, texture, and also sensory analysis. Okay, so let's jump to the results because the yield of meat probably is something that it's one of the most important factors when you decide to exploit or, or, or of the species. So in case of the cryfish, uh, we also were interested in the abdomen part and of the uh, hella part. So the pincers, as uh, we can also call it like that, the yield of meat as a percentage of the body uh, was uh, eight point uh, nearly seven for the abdomen. In in case of the hella, it was two point seven. In case of clam, the edible parts consisted of uh, twenty point five. And we also for the cryfish assess the yield of hard parts as a part as a percentage percent of the body part. Uh, so for the abdomen was a 63, nearly 63, for the hello 687. And in case of the yield of meat, as also as a percentage of the body part, was 37 and uh, 12 respectively for the abdomen and the hello. Why we assess it? Because we are also interested in the non-edible parts and how to uh, Ex, uh, how to manage the non-edible parts and upcycle, for example, compounds that might be extracted from the uh, carapax or from the uh, from the shell. In case of the chemical composition, uh, the level of the protein for the cryfish uh, was comparable between uh, abdomen and kela, but also if you will compare this level to the meat of the farm animals, like a pig or, uh, or beef, uh, then you'll find comparable level of the protein. In case of the clam, this was quite surprising that the level of the protein was a, a way lower uh, comparing either to cryfish or to farm animals. The another uh, uh, striking evidence is that the, the fat level in both species, uh, in the meat and edible parts of the species, uh, was low. So this, uh, what's mean low? Comparing to, for example, a fish species, when you will divide them roughly in the fat, medium, and, and 
and low fat species the 0.26 it's an extremely low fat level in uh, in, in um, fish species and 0.93 it's let's say on the edge between the extremely low and the low fat fish species um when we will jump to the the last uh, row the energetic value 75 77 and then 57 for the clam um this energetic value is significantly lower comparing to the uh, farm animals which has a usually um above 100 uh, kilocalories per 100 uh, grams but this is probably this is not probably but this is due to the level of the of the fat when we will focus on the protein quality of the cryfish and the clam meat the cs so the chemical score uh, is the score that uh, helps you to assess the um, quality of the protein in relation to the uh, standard and in this case the standard uh, officially accepted by the uh, by the FAO it's the um, protein profile in the egg and uh, in case of the abdomen we didn't found any limiting uh, amino acid in the uh, protein that that, uh, that was extracted from the abdomen in case of the kela there was only one um amino acid the, the there was a 95 percent comparing to the uh, to the standard and uh, this was a valine and uh, in case of the clam we found uh, more amino acids limitic amino acids and for example uh, it was a valine leucine or histidine in case of the um, essential amino acid index, the index for, as you see here, for both species was higher comparing to the um, farm animals. And the same when you compare the essential amino acids to non-essential amino acids, the, the level, the ratio uh, that, you, um, that you can see here was also higher comparing to the farm animals. Um, it was higher, for example, in case of the chicken or the duck, but comparable uh, because I have to distinguish the the, spe the species from the group of the farm animal. But was comparable, for example, to the uh, to the beef. If we look at the fatty acid profile and the fat quality, we also um, we received a quite surprising results because uh, when we will focus on the polyunsaturated fatty acids, most of the fatty acids uh, in the cryfish meat uh, were uh, polyunsaturated fatty um, acids and uh, the, the the highest fraction of the um, polyunsaturated fatty acid consisted of the acosapentaonic, so the EPA, and also arachidonic, so the AA fatty acids. And the SFA and M M MUFA, so the saturated fatty acid and the monounsaturated fatty acid consisted, as you see here, the, the other uh, half, roughly. In case of the rangia, uh, the situation was quite different because the saturated fatty acid consisted nearly 50% uh, of the uh, of all fatty acids, and the the the, the highest uh, the, the 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 leading fraction in the saturated fatty acid was acids was the steric steric acid, and in case of the uh, monounsaturated fatty acid and polyunsaturated fatty acid, uh, they consisted the other half. So this was quite surprising that when you only compare the saturated and uh, polyunsaturated and monounsaturated fatty acid between uh, the uh, fatty acid profiles in uh, both um, types of the biological material. 
when we will also focus uh, our attention on the several other parameters like the relation between n3 to, to n6 and in the last column you can see the official recommended values so in case of the crime fish and in case of the clam the level of the uh, the, the ratio between the n3 and n6 was a uh, way higher comparing to the re recommended value so above 0.25 in case of the uh, the sum of the EPA and DHA, um, in one hundred grams of meat of cryfish and the clam, we had sixty nine and seventy six milligrams of uh, those fatty acids respectively, and according to the recommendations per day, uh, the consumer should um, ingest approximately. Uh, 250 milligrams. So uh, the 100 gram of the meat or the edible parts from the clam covers approximately one fourth. The relation between the, the ratio between the polyunsaturated fatty acid and saturated uh, fatty acid, this is another important factor. And this, the results also reflects what I've uh, uh, shown before. For the crayfish, it's 1.45. For the clam, it's 0.6, uh, nearly six, but both the uh, ratios are higher than recommended. That is 1.045. Uh, and comparing to the farm animals, this is uh, the, the level. It's also, of course, uh, the ratio is also higher. But comparing, for example, to the marine fish, it's uh, and it's it's com it's comparable. The uh, second, the the next. Uh, parameter is the ratio between the hypocholesteremic and the hypercholesteremic. So how the um, specific fatty acids influence the metabolism of the cholesterol. And the recommendation is the higher value, the better. And uh, comparing the cryfish uh, and the clam, we see the significant difference between both uh, groups and of course, when we will compare the, these, uh, those values to the farm animals, we'll also find the, uh, the, the value H2H uh, are higher and comparable when you will, will compare it to the marine uh, fish. The other two parameters, so the atherogenic and thrombogenic indices, um, were also uh, lower in this case, were lower comparing to the recommended values. And these values uh, assess also the influence of the specific fatty acids on the um, risk of the cardiovascular disease. So the, the profile of the fatty acids in the clam and, uh, and the cryfish is favorable to prevent from or to reduce uh, the or to do not worsen uh, the cardiovascular uh, problems. When we will uh, focus on the culinary properties in this case of the cryfish meat, because we've got the results for the cryfish meat, and on the hardness, uh, the value in the Newtons was uh, 31. And we, when we will compare to farm animals uh, that has above 100, the meat of the uh, crayfish, it's uh, rather soft. It's not like 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 a spread, but it's it's not so hard comparing to the farm animals. And when we'll focus on the chewiness, uh, here the value is one point two. But for example, for the pork or beef, it's uh, above twenty, like fourteen or sixteen, respectively. The color of the um, of the crayfish meat, it's. Uh, it's uh, characterized by by the uh, by the properties like the like the it's a bit light with uh, some um, bits of the reddish and uh, yellowish color, mm, but uh, when we will focus on the last value, the pH, it's quite uh, interesting because the higher pH might uh, the, the it might, the higher pH might cause problems with the microbial development. So when uh, there is a, 
processing of the crayfish meat at home or uh, at the processing plant. This might be taken in the account because the higher pH might do not reduce the uh, pathogen uh, development. We also focus on the sensory pro properties on, for example, such in this is like a boiled meat, bitter uh, taste, fishy taste, sweet taste, on the sweet taste, a sweet taste. And uh, based on our um, results, we found that the taste of the um, cryfish meat, it's a pleasant, a bit of sweetie. So in, in our opinion, it's a preferable taste, for example, for those who do not like the strong uh, taste of the, of the seaweed or the fishy taste. Um, we also focused on the elements, as I mentioned before, and but I do, do not want to show you the exact the level of the elements. If you would like to, it's not it's uh, it's not a problem. But for the uh, sake of this presentation, we converted the the level of elements into the percent of elements covered with hundred grams of crayfish uh, or the clam. Uh, crayfish meat or the clam edible part and for example when you focus on the values uh, here so that from 9 to 10 percent of the magnesium is covered when you eat 100 gram of the crayfish or for example in case of uh, thing it's 17 percent or in case of the phosphorus it's almost uh, 50 percent when we will eat 100 gram of the crayfish meat. In case of the kela, uh, the zinc uh, might be converted totally when you will ingest 100 grams or um, phosphorus it's uh, 45 or for example the magnesium it's uh, between 11 and uh, 13 and, and a half. Uh, for the clam, uh, uh, as far as now, we've got the results for the last three uh, trace elements. But what's surprising is that the, there is a significant difference between the ferric level. Uh, so we will have to also uh, dive deeper into the results for the ferric because uh, also the speciation might be interesting because non uh, not all the variants of the ferric might be, uh, let's say, ingested or preferable by the consumers at the same level. For both uh, species, we assess the level of the uh, heavy metals, so the lead and also cadmium, and the values were, were way lower comparing to the, uh, in relation to the uh, recommendations. And the, the part that we also perform um, in relation to the population uh, genetics and demographic parameters for the Rangia, um, we were interested in, in, in two questions. The first, where the Rangia come from, origin, the, the, or, the, the original place, let's say the, the original habitat, the refugio, mm -hmm. It's the uh, Gulf of Mexico, but we would like to know how the population that we've collected in the LNG terminal was uh, similar, the level of the similarity comparing to other uh, populations. Uh, and we found that most of the haplotype that we identified in our studies of Rangia were the, the the most similar the, the had the highest genetic similarity to the haplotype one which originated or this is the or origin for this haplotype uh came from the gulf of um, mexico the second question was uh, how the uh, population perform in our region so in the southern baltic in the uh, in the in the region of the let's say the western part of the southern part of the Baltic, and we found based on the several genetic indices like the haplotype diversity, um, nucleotide diversity, neutrality test, and other tests that we've performed, and we found that the, there is a expansion model after bottleneck. So it means that the species adapted as far as we can say now but the species adapted to the salinity of approximately 6 ppm 
and now uh, it's developed. And it, this is confirmed by, by the population admixture. Uh, and this was, uh, of course, a consequence in this case uh, of the allelic sur surface. And this is confirmed by the B modal cure for the uh, pairwise differences between compared uh, genetic data sets. And allelic surfing means that uh, we've got a population, but from time to time, for example, due to anthropogenic uh, activities in the region, we received another batches of the Rangia with different, uh, um, with different uh, haplotypes or genetic diversity. So this is, this is called allelic surfing. And not only this means that the species from the uh, US were directly transferred to the southern part of the Baltic, of course, but the species were transferred primarily to one of the harbors along the coast of the Europe. And there, due to the further transport, so the secondary or primary ships, the uh, individuals of uh, Rangia were transferred to the uh, to the southern Baltic. We've got also additional data that shows the uh, the age structure and the size structure and the B allelic cure for the genetic data also confirmed that we found for the uh, morphometric analysis. What are the uh, take home messages for all of us? Is that the the species both species are valuable source of edible raw materials and uh, this can be used for the food, but also non-food purposes. Uh, due to the uh, delicate texture and of course pleasant taste of the cryfish meat, this type of the raw material, of course, after the uh, processing, um, might be uh, ideal for the elderly or the people or the children. The meat of both species is toxicologically safe, as I mentioned in relation to the level of the lead and cadmium, but also um, might be as a supplementary, um, um, the, the meat might, be, might act as a supplementary source for micro and macro elements in human nutrition. Of course, the main concern comparing to farm animals uh, is the constant availability of the material. So in case of the uh, Rangia, this is just developing and we observe how the population behave. And uh, when we went, for example, for the sampling, so four people within one and a half hour were, were able to collect each uh, a bag with one kilogram of, of, of Rangia, for example. Uh, and it was quite uh, easy. Uh, but it's not always that the population is stable through a whole the, uh, year, so all the seasons, because there is a high dynamics related to the biology of the, uh, of the species. So, as I mentioned, the main concern is the constant availability. In case of the um, cryfish uh, in Poland and probably also in other countries uh, in the Baltic region, uh, mainly uh, in Scandinavia, it's easy to to buy, easy, maybe easy when you know where to find it. So you know who is uh, collecting, who is catching the, the crayfish, uh, but it's fairly easy to, to find uh, such species if you you are interested to, to have such for, for a dinner. And of course, this is not the end, this is just the beginning for, for the studies, uh, because uh, we are interested in additional and culinary quality, and also in uh, upcycling of byproducts. So how we can use the, uh, the material, the, the non-edible material, to process it and to extract compounds and to use this compound for the other uh, sectors, not only food, food sectors, but maybe for the uh, pharmaceutic sector or for the cosmetic sector. So lots of challenges ahead. I would like to thank you all for the attention. Thank you very much.